And I'm still fascinated with the space transportation issue, which I consider satellites part of the space transportation system. To me, it goes all the way from skateboards to cars to planes to buses to, to rockets to satellites. And, and rockets and satellites just are a very immature part of the transportation system. And uh, so in a lot of ways, I see where we are with rockets and satellites as much like the U.S. auto industry was around 1900. And uh, at that point in time, there were a lot of companies. There was eventually consolidation. Time for another episode of the Cold Star Project. I'm here with Jim Cantrell. He is the founder of Stratspace. It's been around a long time, right after uh, he got out from working as a business development guy for Elon Musk at SpaceX. And uh, that was a very interesting research process for me. I went, hmm, this year and that year when SpaceX were founded were very similar. And I didn't realize there was a connection yet. And then I dug in a little more and went, aha. Yeah. So Stratspace has been around a long time now. It's been involved in 46 satellite and deep space missions. It's uh, gotten technically involved in a lot of these projects from a light sail program to something called OSIRIS REx that we'll dig into a little bit more. And uh, you've had clients uh, like NASA, the Air Force, uh, NRO, and a lot of major aerospace companies, and a lot of startups too that uh, people will recognize, um, like Moon Express and York Space Systems and that. So. Let's, let's get to the starting question here. It's 2002, you're just out of SpaceX. What makes you commit to small sats as a core business? Why not launch vehicles like what Elon was doing? Yeah, so in terms of satellites, I mean, that was kind of my background. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I went to, went to college, I uh, was in mechanical engineering, but I ended up, uh, my first job was building balloons for Mars, so it was neither a launch vehicle or a satellite. But uh, one of the things that uh, we did a lot, yeah, at, uh, in my uh, uh, academic career was uh, satellite designs. And so uh, my first love was really towards satellites. Launch vehicles were something that was generally not done by small teams. And that really changed with SpaceX. And so, you know, with, uh, with Elon, uh, when he showed up, he, he didn't show up to build a launch vehicle. He showed up really to, to do this mission to Mars. And uh, the reason he came to me was I knew about Russian launch vehicles and uh, been part of a group that had converted ICBMs in the former Soviet Union to satellite launchers. It was better to use it for that than for tossing weapons around the earth. And uh, so, so that's what we went to Russia for, Elon and I, to uh, see if we could buy some of these rockets for this Mars mission. And that's kind of a well-known story that uh, ended up not, not uh, generating a rocket for sale, but uh, started SpaceX. So Back then, I mean, if you you got to take yourself back 20 years, and it really tells you how much has changed. Um, we all thought Elon was an insane person for wanting to do this, and I think maybe he did too. Uh, but as he put it, he'd rather you know put his money into this uh, rocket and burn it all up than to leave it in the warehouse in Moscow. And uh, so at that time, though, only big companies with government funding and billions of dollars built rockets. So the idea of, you know, this guy who, you know, he's, he's, he's so well known and such a celebrity now, but back then he was a, really a, kind of a nobody. And, uh, you know, he had no background in it. And he says, I'm going to build a rocket. And we all thought he'd lost his mind. And his friends thought he'd lost his mind. You know, and there was an intervention with Adeo Ressi, who was a good friend of his that I worked with in the early days. And, uh, you know, Adeo said, what, what are you doing this for? You know, you lost it. So here we are 20 years later. And he, he's basically stealing all of the rice bowls of all the babies that used to do this. And uh, so, so that's, that's why I think in a lot of ways, a lot of people have followed him. He made space safe for investing and made space safe for these small teams. But 20 years ago, small teams were actually doing the satellites. Now, we weren't really mainstream back then, but you know, to be able to do a satellite for three or $4 million, people thought was insane. And so, uh, you know, that was what I was attracted to was these small teams that could really do something, get it done, that could build something in a short period of time and move on to something else. Awesome. Yeah, there's nothing like uh, hearing it from the guy who was actually right there. <laughs> <laughs> love that. I love that. So I, I've seen, you know, in your resume, you, you've you gone into companies and turned them around and that and fixed the financial situations and that sometimes. You've had opportunities to bring people on board, I imagine, in these organizations that you're leading. What do you look for when you're choosing the right people to bring in to work for you? 
Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And, and I've made as many mistakes as I think I've made correct decisions in life. And uh, this is particularly true on people. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to ask, but I'll tell you what, I, what I've learned. Um, you know, what's come to me in the end of the day is something that, that uh, the SEAL team guys use. I, I, I put out on my LinkedIn page the other day a Simon Sinek video where he talks about how the SEAL Team 6, which is now called Dev Group, they, uh, how they pick their, their, their people and they, they have an access for trust and an access for performance. And nobody wants a low performance, low trust person, right? We all, we all agree on that. Everybody wants a high performance, high trust person. What's interesting though is do you bias yourself towards performance or do you bias yourself towards trust? I used to be of the high performance any trust category. What I found is my bad experiences really resulted from trusting the wrong people. And that extends both personally and professionally. So the first thing I really look for anymore is can I really trust this person? And it's not so much in my experience do people know what they need to know to do the job, it's do they have the right attitude to do it? Can you trust them to do it? Um, I was, uh, my mentor in, in, in my career was Dr. Frank Red, who started the Small Satellite Conference. And he was a retired Air Force officer, and he had sort of this way of managing people where he just said, go do it, and he trusted you. And I sort of picked up on that, as so that's the way I manage things. So if you don't, you know, if you want to, you know, be, be a, uh, a parent and uh, watch, watch your, your employees like you with children, well, okay, you can, you can maybe hire the ones that you don't trust. But for me, the life's too short to be chasing people around. Um, and, and so the other thing I look for is people that have that burning desire in their, in their, in their heart to do something. And because that goes a long way. It's people that really aren't excited about something, don't do well at it. And uh, I have six kids, believe it or not. I don't know why I have that many, but it's a whole discussion. And they're all good kids, but they, you know, the thing I have to tell them is find something you love because you'll be good at it. Right. right. Well, that, that was a very interesting answer. And, uh, and it's good. It wasn't what I expected. So that's awesome. Um, let's talk about venture capital funding for a minute. Sometimes you, you can help organizations um, find that venture capital funding. And I'm curious what investors are looking for most in space ventures, other than, hey, I'm going to get my money back and hopefully a little profit here. Yeah, it's kind of a curious question. Um, it's a good one, actually. So traditionally, you know, venture capital had sort of a bad reputation in particular. And there's, there's a lot more out there besides venture capital, right? So you have the early types that we call them uh, angel investors or seed investors. They write small checks, but take high risks. And they look at different things than venture capital, which is typically early to mid stage. And they write bigger checks, but take modestly high risks. And then you have sort of the, uh, the, the private equity types that, write very large checks. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. They take very low risks, right? And, and with each one of these, what they're looking for are different things. So it's, it's interesting, the, the, the angel investors, it's all about the person, right? Mm -hmm. they, they meet you, they like you. There's again, this question of trust, can they trust you? Are you excited? Say, my, my same sort of parameters of choosing people, they'll choose the same ones to invest in. And I've had investors who will say, you know, I like somebody that's really outspoken. I've had others that go look at my Twitter feed and say, oh, you're too outspoken. You know, so, so it's kind of individual uh, what, they, what they like. Um, and so, so they're not so much looking at a return. They are. They're obviously investing for a return, but they expect, you know, one in 10 of these to turn out maybe. So they, they throw a lot of seeds out. That's why they write small checks. And uh, I, in, in fact, have been a, an angel investor in the space business. Uh, that's kind of how I do. I do it with, with individuals that I really know and trust, and I, I believe in what they're doing. So then you get into VCs, and and what they're looking at is the team and the idea, hmm. right? Any good business plan is fundable, and so they're looking at, at a team, and they think that the team can carry it off. And is this an idea that that looks like it might turn into? Generally, they're looking for unicorns, and it's the same philosophy that the angel investors have, where they're going to make 10 investments and one will turn into a unicorn. If you look at Sequoia's portfolio, for example, you know, there, there's just a few companies that carry their entire portfolio performance. But, you know, have, if you could only choose those, they certainly would. They wouldn't choose the losers. But, uh, you know, these VCs are very quick to just turn off the spigot off once they decide that this is not a winning company. 
and so they move along. And then then the the private equity guys now they're the ones that are that are you know hoping that the one and two are turning out to be these 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 big hits, right? And the ones that aren't the big hits are at least not going to lose a lot of money, right? Because their 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 return expectation is much lower, uh, so so they're looking at lower risk. So so that's why when you when you build these companies. You have to start small. It's it's kind of like one time I went fishing in, in Florida. First time I went sport fishing when I was living in the West. And we went out and the first fish I caught was an 18 inch mackerel. And I, I said to the, the the guy that was helping us, I said, hey, breakfast. And he said, no, no, this is bait. And so he chopped it into two and he put it on hooks and threw it back in the water. And that's kind of what you do with investor money is you is you go out and you and you, you use the early money to create enough progress so you can hook the bigger fish like the VCs and then use their money to hook the private equity. And that's how you create the, the LinkedIn's of the world. That's how you create the Facebook's of the world. It's, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that financially that's really how you build it. Right. And so you've got to go through those, those layers and the, the, I guess the uh, equity investors, by the time you get that far, you should have proven the concept and shown, okay, yes, we have revenue and we're, you know, successfully providing this service. Well, so, so on that point, I think this is an important point to make. Really, revenue is not expected until you get to the, the private equity stage. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have when you're in the in the VC stage, but it's not necessarily true. That's why you see some of these Wall Street offerings of an IPO, and these guys are losing money like crazy. Mm -hmm. People are still investing in it, right? Because they're they're investing in the blue sky of the of the of the concept, and they're and they're pushing the 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 future out. So their expectation is not to have revenues right away. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is Jason Canigan, the host of the Cold Star Project and the founder of Cold Star Technologies. I've decided to do something new. I've started doing daily update videos on who I met and what I learned the previous day in the space field. And it's a great sort of follow me thing. You can learn what I learn. I'm meeting a heck of a lot of people and learning a lot of things really fast. And the space field is really disparate. There are tons of nooks and crannies to go into and explore from legal, operational, you know, regulatory compliance and gosh the end customer <laughs> who'd have thought about that right so you can sign up for this if you go to coldstartech.com slash msb that's short for make space boring the mission we're on then you can sign up and in your email you will get a daily notification that the new video has been posted I'm also thinking about doing some branded mini courses and summarizing papers as uh, I'm able to. So those will be some goodies that are in there as well. So if you're interested in that, go to coldstartech.com slash MSB and join us on the mission to make space boring. Now back to the interview. Okay, let's move on to a couple projects here. And this one I want to make sure I pronounce, I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong. Is it ISI? That's exactly right. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss something there. So tell us about this project and, and, and Stratspace's involvement in it. So ISI is a company out of uh, Finland, mm -hmm. and they build miniature uh, radar imaging satellites. So uh, you can image the Earth in invisible wavelengths like you and I are looking at each other. You can do it in, in infrared, which is basically heat uh, or reflected sunlight. Or, or you can do it with radar, which is radio waves, much like your phone, that you, you send down to the Earth and reflect back. So radar imaging is kind of interesting because it works day and night because you're generating your own energy that's coming back. It also works through clouds. So if you, uh, during the last hurricane that, that went through the Bahamas, uh, ISI had a satellite up where they were able to, to image the Bahamas in real time as the storm was going over. And because of the nature of how the, the X-band the X energy came back from, from the surface of the earth, they could actually tell you where all the water was. So they could map the floods out they could map out where cars were, where buildings were, where they weren't, and so forth. So it's an incredibly powerful imaging technology that, again, like rockets, was once the sole domain of governments, you know, primarily the intelligence agencies. And so when ISI first came to me about six years ago, it was through an investor who asked me to do some diligence on them, which uh, I've done a lot of. And uh, this, this particular uh, group um, came True, true was a true investments. They came to me and they said, "Look, what do you what do you think?" And I looked at their their design. I was skeptical at first, but as I talked to the people and I said, "This is a really good team," and I think they could actually pull this off. And uh, much like my early days in satellites and early days with rockets with Elon, you know, I'm 
I'm, I'm one of the few guys that can kind of see through the BS and say, well, I think this will actually work. I'm not the guy necessarily that takes it all the way to the end. And I could see that these guys were very real. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I joined their board of uh, advisors and then later the board of directors. And I'm, I'm an investor and shareholder in ISI. And they're doing great. And so they've got three satellites up now. They're uh, just finishing their Series B financing and they're going to put a whole constellation up. And uh, they're, uh, they're, they're creating quite a stir because they're doing what only governments could do once. And, and people would tell me there's several people that are in the news. I'm not going to mention their names who actually felt threatened by ISI's existence because it threatened some, some uh, U.S. Uh, classified budgets because they were really making uh, fools out of, out of the traditional suppliers who couldn't build for a billion dollars what these guys are building for a million. Hmm. It sounds like the SpaceX story all over again. Yeah. Huh. Interesting technological advantage there. Was there anything unusual about that project? Did you learn something that you were surprised to find out in the process of, of working on that? There's a couple of things. It's more related to people and, and, and I would say uh, bureaucracies and government. Um, you know, I warned these guys when they started. I said, look, you know, I've worked on, on these kinds of projects in, in classified environments. And, you know, they're, they're, there's a tendency for these projects to disappear because they threaten budgets. And I told them this, this will happen, right? What surprised me, and this was sort of my, my idea in the beginning was being in Finland was perfect. They were a non-aligned country. They weren't NATO. They weren't, they weren't uh, Eastern Bloc aligned or anything like that. Perfect neutral country. Um, and what surprised me is actually the, the DOD is buying their imagery now. Uh, now that they've got it up and uh, it's, it's proving to be very, very worthwhile. And uh, w what's also surprising to me is how sensitive this has gotten with mm -hmm. respect to, uh, you know, the, these kinds of things. But the other side sort of uh, that I've learned with this is, is again, it's, it's about people and the, and the two founders, Pekka is the one and, and Rafal is the other, you know, they're very young. They're, they're my son's age, you know, they're in their, in their late twenties, early thirties. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they didn't know what they didn't know, right? And that was a very powerful thing to watch them not assume you couldn't do things. And uh, I, I was not going to be the person that, uh, you know, was going to tell them they couldn't do things. But, you know, I, I helped them by assembling, you know, review teams and we looked over their spacecraft and we, you know, we Stratspace redesigned their spacecraft for them at one point. Uh, because it was really going in the wrong direction. And, and they, they were willing to listen to us and, and make changes. And, and it's that kind of person that, that really becomes successful. And that's one of the things that has, has formed my basis of, you know, how you pick people. Hmm. Your question. Okay. Well, the operations management guy in me loves the, hey, why should we do things the way we've always done them? Right. <laughs> that's silly yeah. question. And uh, so that, that's great to hear about. Uh, there's a project, uh, I think a little more recent, called OSIRIS-REx, um, that Stratspace ran uh, under a contract to the University of Arizona, and you worked on uh, ground data systems and right. some software in that. So I, I, I don't know anything about ground data systems, so I'm curious about what, what is the weird, unexpectedly complicated thing about working with ground data systems? Well, let me just explain what OSIRIS-REx <laughs> is for sure. Yeah. You're, you're, do that. So I don't know what it is. Hmm. Uh, it's a NASA-funded project. It's a billion-dollar class mission that's going to an asteroid uh, called Bennu, and B E N U, and it's uh, an asteroid that nobody's been able to really image from the Earth. We don't know what it is. There's a lot of scientific reasons they're interested in it, and it's it's got to approach the asteroid, slow down, follow it, and then it's got to orbit around it. And because asteroids aren't you know perfectly round like the Earth. They, they tend to be, you know, clumps of, of boulders and things. They're very irregular, and to orbit around it is a very unusual thing. It's very difficult to do because there's a weird gravity field. And so you have to approach it very slowly, and you have to measure, map the gravity, go closer, measure more, map the gravity. So it's, it's, it's almost like something you just have, something dangerous you have to approach very slowly. Eventually, they want to get close enough to grab a, a, a chunk of it off and return the sample to Earth. So uh, your, your understanding of the asteroid has to be perfect. So I got a call um, uh, long after the program was funded and started uh, from our, a local guy named Dante Loretta, who initially I thought he was Italian, right? 
And uh, we're, we're forbidden as, as Americans from working on foreign satellite programs generally and rockets especially. And I thought, oh, I need this like a hole in the head. You know, I need an Italian uh, with, a, with an asteroid mission. And so as I got to talking to him, I realized he was a PI at the University of Arizona. Hmm. And they were, they were in trouble on their, their software that would map this asteroid and generate commands for the, for the, the satellite to get closer and closer. So, it, again, this was another kind of a classic consulting thing. I said, well, let me come in and have a look. NASA was, was threatening all sorts of actions, you know, because it was not on schedule. And they were going to have the software done by the time they launched, which mm-hmm. technically was okay. So we came in, we looked at it, and we said, well, what you really need is systems engineering, which really says, you know, what are, what are the requirements of this, this ground data system? When we, what are we measuring about the asteroid? How are we collecting it? How are we processing it? How are we turning it into information that's then useful to plan back the mission? So it took a combination of people interested in software, People understood, you know, astrodynamics, and it turned out I was—I I wrote a paper in college with a couple other guys on orbiting about irregular shaped asteroids. So it was like I was a needle in a haystack for these guys, mm-hmm. and we got some really good software talent, and uh, we helped them finish that. And it was a very successful program, and it's—it's—it's it's, it's orbiting around Bennu right now. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember when the uh, sample uh, acquisition date is, but it's—it's it's coming up probably within a year. Right. So you can't simulate this thing before you get there because there is no data. And then it's got to be able to come in, gather data, not crash into it while it's doing that, um, map it, and then decide what to do next. Exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, and then you did some mission operations software development, which we talked about um, and my question was, what was the biggest hurdle of keeping it on schedule? Well, clearly it wasn't on schedule before you got there. It was, it was kind of off schedule. Yeah. And it yeah. wasn't just us. I mean, it was yeah. a big effort. And, you know, Dante got personally involved, which is, hmm. takes that kind of leadership and um, um, a b- bunch of other people. But it was mainly just getting everybody to sing to the same. It's like an orchestra, right? You, hmm. you have to have the conductor. The system engineer is kind of like the conductor of the orchestra. So then having all these people playing off tune, we had to get them all playing nicely together. There were a few people that had to leave. There were a few people that had to join. And so it's, you know, we call that getting the right people off the bus and the right mm-hmm. people off the bus. And once we did that and set a schedule and, and held them to it, you know, we just have to come in and say, you know, you said you were going to do this on Monday and it's not done. Why aren't you done? So some public shaming, you know, and then, and then after a while it just, it just came together. So, so it's, it's typical of, you know, what we saw in, consulting on businesses you know when i when i did turnarounds they never call when things are going good they call mm-hmm. when the house is on fire you know so, so you, you come and you say well do we want to go in the house or not it's burning you're going to get hurt and then you, you okay well this is you know so you, everybody's problems are unique but the, the causes are usually like seven or eight of them mm-hmm. you know you gotta figure out which one right <laughs> i love the analogy of the burning house oh so- yeah what what kind of projects are you looking for now? Well, so I uh, recently got finished with a company called Vector, where we're building a, a launch vehicle, and uh, so I'm I'm sort of uh, figuring out what's next for me. Hmm. And uh, all I can tell you is it's going to be build something. Hmm. And I'm still fascinated with the space transportation issue, which I consider satellites part of the space transportation system. Uh, and uh, I, you know, it, to me, it goes all the way from skateboards to cars to planes to buses to, to rockets to satellites and and rockets and satellites just are a very immature part of the transportation mm-hmm. system and uh, so in a lot of ways I see where we are with rockets and satellites as much like U.S. auto industry was around 1900 and uh, mm-hmm. at that point in time there were a lot of companies there was eventually mm-hmm. consolidation so I, I just feel like I've got to get back back into that and uh, so that's that's when I'm working some plans to get back into that. Um, I thought maybe I'd retire and that lasted about three weeks and uh, <laughs> go back to work. <laughs> Makes sense. Now, you're a road racing guy. You've got a company called Vintage Exotics that uh, goes and finds and restores vintage race cars. How do you, how do you go about doing that? Uh, do you go to Italy and grab all these Ferraris and whatnot or what, what, what's involved? Last week, but mm-hmm. yeah, so, so mostly the cars find us, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a funny okay. situation, but uh, 
uh, they're, they're like, you know, stray cats and stray dogs that come to find you. And, uh, you know, so, so we do a combination of, of things to you know, pay the bills there. We, we have a race team, which is sort of our ultimate goal of the, of the, uh, of the enterprise is to, to go racing and to create value within racing. But to, to create uh, uh, revenue, we, we build parts uh, that, that go on race cars. So typically the lighting systems are, you know, for endurance racing, you have to race at night. So we're a bit of an expert on, on the lighting systems for these. And that's turns out there's not many lighting experts in the world. I sort of discovered this by accident when I, we built one of our first endurance cars and then we made lights for it. And I said, well, I guess I get to learn this. And so I went out and learned about the optics of light systems and how all that works. And then LEDs came along and we adapted to that. So we've got a whole product line there. Um, we, we actually do find, or they find us, uh, vintage vehicles we, we buy, sell, restore. And most of the restorations for other customers, we have clients from as far away as, as uh, uh, Greece, and uh, they send their cars to us. We've, we've had clients in England send their cars to us. Uh, we have a lot of Scandinavian clients and so forth, So, and a lot of U.S. clients. So it's um, that's, a, that's an interesting and gratifying part of the business, but that generally doesn't make much profit. Uh, and then, uh, you know, then, then we also do uh, uh, work with race teams. And, uh, we, we can't get a little bit of sponsorship money for our own race team as well. Okay. And, and I guess final question here, you were a racing instructor for a number of years. What, what was the most interesting thing that you got out of that experience? <laughs> that it's exactly like business, right? <laughs> and there's a book in this, the five things I learned about race team is applied to business. And, and uh, you know, it's funny because uh, when you're dealing as an instructor with, with individuals who, who want to learn how to race, uh, they come in all various shapes and sizes and, and skill levels. And they also come with various levels of, of ego. And mm. it's, it's latter. That's sort of your trust side of the equation, right? You have to really look at their ego and the ones that say, Oh yeah, I understand all of this. You don't get in the car with them. Right. <laughs> until, they, until they humble themselves to understand that their driving on the street has absolutely nothing to do, nothing to do mm. with the driving on the track. Uh, then you can start with those those kinds of people, uh, but until they get there, they're just a danger to themselves and everybody else. So, so you, that's the sort of the common thing with business, right? A lot of people think they can run a business, and they have no no clue how to do it, right? And all of us are guilty, you know. I I got degrees in engineering, I have a business degree. I got into it and said, well, never had a lesson. Here we go. But of course, I didn't kill myself or my family in the process. Um, cars are not that forgiving as business. Business just generally money, but but cars you know tend to be the, the other way. So you know a car when you when you get on the track they'll 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 perform much more than people realize. And and I had this experience when I had my first instruction at Skip Barber. One of the instructors, uh, you know, we 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 were out playing around in the Formula cars, and they said, "Oh, that's nice. You know, come out in this Miata with me." One of my instructors, Terry. Uh, Earwood, he he took me out, and we had these headsets on. We could talk to each other. It was at Seabird and Raceway, and uh, we we started driving around the corners. I mean, he was he was sliding this car, and he was going so damn fast in it. And, and I, it was like these aha moment for me. I said, "This car will do this, right?" And so so the cars are capable of so much more once you get the experience and the understanding. It, it becomes a completely different world. And uh, this is this is what people don't get about racing. It's mm. The closest thing I can find is, you know, my, my friends, I've, I've never been in war, right? Unfortunately, I've not had to go into the theater, but the guys that have been in the theater sort of describe it in the same way we describe racing. You know, it's a mm -hmm. form of combat, far less lethal in our case. Um, and, and the performance that you're capable of far exceeds what you ever think. And uh, it, you end up with this sort of brotherhood or sisterhood of, of people that, that do this, that, that we're, we're very close bonded to each other. We can be fierce competitors. But if they need help, we help them, right? And and so that's the that's the other very surprising thing that that came to me on this was the sense of brotherhood that I never I never had in any other walk of life, and, and that's what keeps bringing me back every every time. Right. Wow. Great stories. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm a I'm a more of a NASCAR racing fan, but I also like road racing. I've learned more about it because we were going to have this talk. So I went oh, okay. and checked out some of the stuff that you've personally done. You've, you've driven at some endurance races and uh, done pretty well. So if people want to uh, connect up with you, Jim, how should they go about doing that? Yeah, so you know, if you're just curious what I'm up to, my, my random thoughts are on Twitter. 
and James N. Cantrell, and I don't go by a false name out there. So uh, most of most of the people that write crappy stuff on my on my wall do. But mm -hmm. um, JimCantrell.com is my my personal website. If anybody's interested in speaking opportunities, I do professional speaking. You can get to me through there. And uh, I have an Instagram page that mostly amuses my children. So James N. Cantrell there. All right. Well, Jim Cantrell, he's running Strat Space. Thanks a lot for being here. I really enjoyed our conversation. My pleasure.